When you think about money, what do you think about? When you think about money, do you have good thoughts or do you have bad thoughts? Most of us, when we think about money, we think about the fact that we need more (laughs) and we think about how much more we want. Okay, let me ask you another question. What do you think God thinks about money? What does God have to say about money? Today, title of the message, how to seek God first in my finances. And you're already here, so you can't walk out. (laughs) How do you seek God first? How do I seek God first in my my finances? You know, there's two subjects that always feel real awkward for people when they're talked about in church, and those two subjects are money and sex. Okay, And it's ironic because those are the two things that are most dominant in our thinking and most certainly most dominant in our culture. Just think about it. There's nothing more dominant than money and sex in our culture. But here's the reality. God has a plan plan for your money. And God has a plan for your sex. And you're like, well, can we just skip to the sex and skip past the money? God has a plan God has a way, God has an order in which you and I are to seek him when it comes to our finances. I want you to think about your money and the fact that your money has a trail. Isn't that true? That every one of us, if we track down and walk down the trail of our money, it would reveal a lot about us. What does your money trail say about you? What does my money trail say about you? about me? Well, it'll tell you a few things. It'll tell you that I love this church. It'll tell you that I love my wife and my kids. I mean, I just flew down to Boise, Idaho for less than 24 hours to sit poolside to watch a few water polo games and flew right back. That cost some money. But you know what? I did it. Dakota, I wouldn't do that for you, buddy. I love you. But I don't love you that much. I'll do that for my son. That's right. yeah. I'll do that for my, my daughter. Yep. Our money has a trail. Here's what's interesting. When you love something, you give to that something. And here's what's even more amazing about that. What's the scripture said? For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. When you love something, you give yeah. to that Something, and, and, and what's incredible, and, and this is what I hope will happen today as we just talk about what it looks like to seek God in our first and our finances, that we just, just relax. Some of y'all are so tight right now. Just relax, just take a deep breath and open your hands and, and just relax because here's the reality. God gave you 100% of himself before he asked anything of you. Yes, he did. 100%. He gave his one and only son. He, he paid a debt that you could not pay through his son's death. Jesus paid it all for you and for me. Now, let me ask you a question. How much of your sin did Jesus take? 10%? Was it 10%? I'm glad it wasn't 10%. 25%? 50%? 85%? If Jesus had taken 99.9%, the fraction left still causes death in our lives and separates us eternally from God. He gives us 100%. Why? Because he loves us. What you love, you give to. And and God is the perfect model of of generosity. How many of y'all believe that God's people should be the most generous people on the planet? We absolutely should. Why? Because God is generous. We have a God who is generous. Matthew 6, 21. It's one of my favorite scriptures. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you reverse engineer this and you start to think about it, if there's anything that you don't love, Start giving money to it. Think about it. 
If you're struggling, not loving something, the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Just start giving to it, I promise you, you'll start paying attention to it. You'll start loving it a little bit more. I just would encourage you to try that. If you're struggling loving something, just start throwing some money at it. All of a sudden, your interest in that area will all of a sudden get big. If you want to know what I love, all you have to do is look at my bank statement. I love this church, I love my wife, I love my kids, and I love fishing a lot. And that is reflected in my bank statement. And listen, we are a church that talks about hard things. We're about church that talks about things that really matter. And how many of you guys know money matters? Man, it just matters. It's it's just the reality. Matter, money matters to you and it matters to me. And God has a plan for our money. So here's how I want to approach this talk today, because I just, I really want to help you. That, that's the hope. Today's not a Bible beat down on your money, uh, and, and I hope you never feel that in any way. I mean, there's times that we all need to be corrected, but how many of you guys know that God's word, and when it corrects us, leads us to life and liberty? And that's what, the, that's what the heart is behind today's talk, as we look at what it looks like to seek God first in our finances, but there's tension in it. Let's just be honest. So three tensions that I will face when seeking God first with my money. If you're a note taker, that's the heading for your notes. Three tensions that I will face when seeking God first in my finances. If you're considering maybe trying this for the first time or returning back to this because you're used to and you don't anymore, there's gonna be some tensions that you're gonna have to face. There's gonna be some walls that you're gonna hit. And the first one can be summed up in one word. Here it is, ownership. The word ownership, and you go, well, where's the tension in that? Where's the tension in my money? And who owns my money? Because it's my money. I earned my money. I put the time in, I whatever, inherited it. I invested in it. It's my money. Side note, did y'all see that lightning struck the Christ the Redeemer statue in in Rio, you didn't see that? It's crazy, it's a crazy picture. And I'm just saying, if you wanna start claiming your money's your money, <laughs> because who created you? Who, who gave you the ability and me the ability to earn the money? Who gave your mom and dad the ability to earn the money they left you? God did. Okay, who sustains you? Who's giving you the, the breath in your lungs to breathe right now? Hey, try working without breathing. Try earning money without breathing. Psalm 24, one through two, it says this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Hey, guess what? That includes your money. Everything in it. The world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. One of my favorite sections of scriptures is Colossians chapter one. It talks about the supremacy of Christ and it says this, speaking of Jesus, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and what? And for him. So your money is created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So you may be thinking, okay, okay, yes, okay, I understand. It's all God's. If that's, if that's all I gotta say so we can move past this point, great. He owns it, I don't. Ownership. But hey, it's one thing to say that and another thing to live it. And I think that's where a lot of us are today. We would say, yeah, God, everything belongs to God, and God's the one that blesses me to earn the money I make and and provide the way for my family. But the reality is, is that we don't live our lives as if he owns it. We live our lives as if we own it. And really what he's done for you and for me is he's given it to us, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit, he's given it to us to manage And some of us are really bad managers with our money. And it's why we are in the situation financially because we're actually not doing our finances the way God would have us do our finances, okay? Testing comes before blessing. This is true in your finances, this is true in everything. 
I mean, you don't get these bad boys without testing the biceps, okay? You, you gotta put the biceps to test before you get these bulging babies, right, okay? Okay, that, that's true in everything. Uh, why is that funny? It's true in everything. Testing comes before blessing. You gotta go through the test before you're blessed. It's true in your high school diploma. It's true in your graduate degree. It's true in college. You gotta be put to the test before you get the blessing of the diploma. And then it's true in your work. At your, your work, you're put to the test before the paycheck. Like all of this, testing comes before blessing, all right? So let me ask you just a few questions. Don't answer them out loud, but I want you to catalog them in your mind, and I just want you to answer, if you can, just in your mind as I walk through them, okay? Here it is. Don't, don't, don't give me any indication. Just straight, deadpan face. Just look at me for a minute. You're used to it. That's the way you always look at me. That's okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Hey, preacher jokes, okay? All right. All right, here's some questions for you. Are you in debt? Are you maxed out on credit cards? Are you just keeping your head out of the water financially, living paycheck to paycheck? Do you feel like you're drowning in your debt? Let me come at it another direction. Do you struggle with greed? Do you struggle with jealousy or comparison? Do you find yourself getting angry over someone else's blessing? How about this? Do you have plenty, but you're stressed out about managing and not losing what you have spent your life building? It's a lot of people. A lot of people right now are in an age and stage in their life where you're stressed out about moving things and shuffling things so that you don't lose what you've spent your entire life building. Or maybe you've earned more than you've ever thought you would earn, and now you're at a loss as to what is next, okay? And if you're like the rest of us, you've said yes to at least one of these, and, and God wants to help us, okay? God wants to help us, and that's it's part of what it looks like to seek God first in your finances is that we kind of got to settle this ownership idea. We got to understand that it's not ours, it's his. And when I have realized this in my life, then because it's not mine, I mean, I treat something a little differently when someone lends it to me. You know, I mean, if it's my lawnmower, man, I'll bang that thing up. I won't worry about the rocks I run over. But if someone lends me their lawnmower, man, I'm going to take care of it. You know, I'm I'm going to I'm going to be sure that I return it better than I got. God's lent us what it is that he's given to us. We're talking about ownership and. And God wants to actually get ahead of our stress. And ownership's a big help for that, okay? He wants to get ahead of our stress. He wants to get ahead of our worry. He wants you and I to be able to get on top of our bills, okay? Now, I didn't say he wants to make you rich. And I didn't say that, you know, if you are a Christ follower, you should be rich. I'm not saying that. I don't believe in the prosperity gospel that says you can give your way into prosperity. But what I do believe Um, is that God does want you to live a blessed life, okay? And and the truth is, is if God made some of you wealthy, it'd actually be a curse to you, like it is some professional athletes, people who win the lottery. That's always, you know, a dumpster fire, right? It actually becomes a curse to them, Okay? But all of us would want God, if there was a way, for him to bless our finances, and blessings tangible and intangible, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. But but blessing doesn't always mean receiving something tangible. There's some intangible blessings, okay? But I want you to get this. There are 500 verses in the Bible about prayer. There's another 500 verses in the Bible 
um, on uh, the, the subject of faith. And then there are 2,000 verses in the Bible on money and blessing. Okay? So God has a lot to say about this. Four times the amount that he has to say about prayer. But all we want to talk about is prayer. And all we want to talk about is faith. And God says, well, what about your money? And what about me wanting to bless you? What about the thing that makes your life turn around? How is it that the thing that's most dominant in your life, you don't trust it with me? How is it that you don't even want to talk about it? How is it that when the preacher talks about it, you get all weird? People get funny when you talk about money, okay? And spiritual maturity isn't about what you lay up. It's actually about what you lay down. You just need to get that today, okay? Let that sizzle in your spirit for a moment. Spiritual maturity, this is true in every area of your life. It's not about what you lay up. It's not about what you store up. It's about what you lay down. Down. Jesus talked about money in 16 of his 38 parables. And how you re- uh, handle your money and how I handle my money reveals volumes about your priorities, about your passions, and ultimately about your purpose. I don't know if there's anything else that we can go directly to other than our money that just tells on us so quickly. Yeah. Okay? You ever had a little brother, little sister who just always tell on you? Hey, listen, your money tells on you every day. Oh, no, he didn't. Yeah, your money tells on you every day. It tells where your passions are. It tells where your priorities are. It tells you where your, it tells you ultimately where your trust is, okay? And what you're willing to be, or what you're willing to part with proves actually what you're wanting to be a part of. And so we could say, oh, man, I'm all about seeking first the kingdom of God, but I'm not willing to part with anything that God's brought to me. Well, you can't say that I want to seek God first and I want to be about his kingdom if you're not willing to part with the increase that he's placed in your hands. Can't do it. So we're talking about ownership. That's the first one. It's a tension, isn't it? It's a real tension. Ownership. Is it mine? Is it his? Seeking God first with my finances begins with me relinquishing ownership, yes. with me saying, God, it's mine. It's, it's learning to live with an open, hand, open hands with God. God, you gave it to me, it's yours. You direct it. You, you, this, is, this is why Paul says that God loves a cheerful giver. He wants someone that says, God, it's yours. Not begrudging and not like, you know, white knuckle gripping. Man, he wants you and he wants me to be cheerful. And, and so it, it's, it, it has to come down to ownership, okay? Here's the second word, tension, order, okay, order. Because Jesus puts our priorities, our passions, and our purpose to the test through what the Bible calls the first fruit. Have you ever heard this term? The first fruit. It's an Old Testament term that we see throughout the New Testament as well. The first, fir- the first fruit. And here's what I want you to hear. First ain't second. First ain't second. I know that's improper English. First is not second. It just sounds better. First ain't second. And first ain't third. And first ain't fourth and fifth. First is first. First fruits. I've got my my phone. Hand me my phone real quick. Um, If you were to look at my favorites on my phone, you know how you've got your favorites um, on your contacts? They've got a little thing here called favorites. Okay, here's my favorites. Um, At the top, Sarah is amazing Hartfield. Okay, first. If you looked at my recent calls or my, my recent text, it would be to Sarah is amazing Hartfield. Okay, first. Okay, my, my, my text actually say something about me. Who's in my favorites says something about me. It says something about you as well. And God uses the, the principle of first to, to keep our hearts in check, to help us understand with ownership. We see this first in the Old Testament where God asked his people to bring the first fruits of their crops even before all the other crops. I want to show you this just real quick. Deuteronomy 14 verse 22. You must set aside a tithe for your crops. Tithe means what? Tenth. 
a tenth, okay? You must set aside a tithe of your crops, one-tenth of all your crops you harvest each year. Bring this tithe to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Now, some people go, man, I don't have a problem giving my God the money. It's the church. Well, well, church is God's idea, okay? And I get it. I get it, man. There have been some, like, jacked up situations that have happened with church and money, okay? But, but God, it's God's idea. Just look at it. Take, take it to the designated place of worship. Man, man, God uses the church to extend its kingdom. As a matter of fact, the church is the primary manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth and the church being God's people, okay? That's it. So that's why it says, hey, if we're going to fund the kingdom forward, it's going to take us bringing our first because it's about ownership, but it's also about order, okay? So this was actually already being practiced back in Genesis, okay? In Genesis chapter 28, uh, Jacob said this. He said, in all that you give me, I will give you a tenth, a full tenth. And then you go even before that, Genesis chapter 14, we see Abraham give the priest Melchizedek a tenth. And then so even before God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, there were already practices of the first. There was already practice set in place for man's well-being. Of course, another example of tithing, of bringing your first is the Sabbath. You realize the Sabbath is the idea of the first. Okay, it's the first day. You're supposed to set aside that day, okay? The first day, the, the Sabbath. Um, we're supposed to do that with everything. We're supposed to bring God first. Um, that would be a great title for a series, wouldn't it? Seek first. First in everything. Not just first at the top, but first on everything in the list. Okay, so it's the first fruits concept. This was law. Now here we go, this is gonna get fun. But Pace, we're not bound by the law. Some of you misinformed Bible scholars would like to say to me. Oh, we're not bound by the law. And I would say to you, this is so true. We are not bound by the law. We are not bound by the law because of the grace of Jesus. I got you, even the mean people up saying amen right now, okay? <laughs> but listen to me. Our obligations under grace aren't less, but they're greater than if we're under the law. And I'm gonna show you this, okay? And it's because, it's not because we have to. You see, I don't give because I have to. I don't give because it's a command. And if I don't, I'm getting zapped like the statue in Rio. It's, it's, it's not... It's not a command that I'm bound by. You see, we're told that the system of tithing was law, and we have been forever delivered from that since what? We're under grace. But that leads us to ask the question, what is the relation of the believer to the law? So those of you that say that, and it's the reason you haven't tithed ever, just walk with me in the Bible for a few moments. Okay, because I know some of you are like, you just found it. Oh, well, I'm, it's about grace, man. I'm not bound by the law. And I would say, you're, you're totally right. It's 100% about grace. But grace invites us to more. I want to show you this, okay? What is the difference between law and grace as explained through God's word? Let's go through it. Y'all ready to do a little trip yeah. through Romans? Some of you are. Yeah. Others of you are so mad at me right now. <laughs> Romans 6, 14, for sin will, know, uh, will, will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. If you're under grace, it means grace is above you, right? Aren't you grateful that grace is above us? Yes. We're under grace, we're not under the law. When we're under the law, the law stressed us out. The law was like, man, there's no way that could ever, ever obey the law. There's no way that I can bat a thousand. There's no way. But with grace, 
Grace covers us and grace empowers us, okay? We are now under the law of Christ and the law of Christ fulfills the law of the commandments. Romans 6 or Romans 7 verses 4 and 6 says this, so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong, not, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that, here we go, we might bear fruit for God. But now, by dying to once bound us, we have been released from the law, here we go, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not the old way of the written code, okay? What this is saying is that we should, should value our riches in Christ so highly. We should value the gospel so highly. We should value the freedom of our sin over our sin so highly that we would simply love to give to anything that would fund that, that we would value it in such a great way and have such a higher perspective of what it's all about. Listen, everything is better in Christ. Can we agree with that? Well, shouldn't your giving be? Oh, hit you with the left. Everything's better with Jesus. Yes. Shouldn't your finances be? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yep. And there's freedom in trusting God with this. What are we talking about? We're talking about order. We're talking about order. Mm -hmm. There's two things here. First, the Christian is liberated from the righteous demands of the law as a means of of acceptance of God, okay? In other words, we can stand righteous before God, not because of our works, because of what Jesus did for us, right? That tells us that in Romans. Also, the Christian is liberated from the penalty which the law inflicts on the transgressor. Why? Because Christ paid that penalty on the cross. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. If we disobey one of God's laws, then it is sin no matter what our privilege may be. Just follow me, okay? Therefore, this new liberty into which grace has brought us cannot free us from the moral and spiritual obligations of the law. Think about it. We wanna say, oh man, we're free from the law. And all of a sudden, we're haters of the law. You should love the law because the law leads to liberty. Okay, now I'm not talking about all the other laws that the Jews added in the ceremonies, but I'm talking about the ways of God, the principles of how to live our lives. The ways of God lead to liberty. The ways of God, the laws of God lead to freedom. God, God's ways lead to freedom. And why we would wanna be liberated from things that would lead us to freedom blows my mind. And I'll tell you, our issue has got to do with ownership and it's got to do with order, okay? And, and money is a minor detail compared to what Paul is talking about when he says that we're not under law but under grace. Again, I'll show you this, Romans seven twelve. So the law is what? It's holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So we're under grace, actually, that we may better fulfill the law. That's why we're under grace, that we can walk in the liberty and the freedom that we could not. Yes. At one point, it was a beatdown to us. At one point, it, all we have is willpower, but now, because of grace, we have Holy Ghost power yes. to empower us to walk in liberty, to empower us to walk in grace. Okay, Romans 8, two through four. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So because we have grace, we should actually do more than the law requires. So you say, I'm not bound by the law. Well, if you look and you study the New Testament and the New Testament church, it was built by men and women who gave more than the tithe. I mean, if you really want to play that game, you want to go back to the Old Testament way because New Testament Christians give more. 
Oh, yeah. Ooh, it's quiet. <laughs> Give more, okay? And it, here's the amazing thing about it. It moves from obeying God, not because we have to, but because we get to, yes. okay? And part, part of the order and part of the ownership is the world has just so deceived us in what is truly valuable and what is worth our giving our lives to. When all the while God is saying, listen, I'm inviting you to invest into what is eternal and what is, has kingdom impact, okay? Tithing was a major test back then and it's a major test now, and why? Because it involves serious trust. If you're taking notes, write this down. God asked for the first because giving him the first requires faith, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. God always wants to move us to having to step out in faith because faith requires trust, and this is one of the areas that many of us need to be liberated in because we never trusted God. I know all the reasons. I can understand all the reasons. I empathize with all the reasons. But I'm telling you, there's liberty and there's freedom in trusting God, okay? The first portion is the redemptive portion. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Okay, in the Old Testament times, they were farmers and, and they raised cattle. And so their first were, you know, were, was livestock or was crops. Now today we might be a banker or a teacher or a barista or a bartender or a lawyer or a doctor or a construction worker, whatever. Your increase comes in that way, but it's still about the first. It's about the first for you and it's about the first for me. The first per portion is the trigger of what redeems the rest, okay? So listen, order matters. So it's not just the amount, it's the order, okay? It's not just relinqu relinquishing ownership, it's about going, God, I put you first. And in, and in putting you first, I honor you. I recognize you as the giver of all good things in my life. And here's the last one, okay? The third one is oversight, oversight. It's another way of saying stewardship, okay? There's tension in oversight. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question, and it is a trick question. You ready for it? Here it is. Think about it before you answer it. Okay, who is in charge of your money? Everybody's afraid to answer. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. Mine too. You know who's in charge of your money? You are. Well, well you just said it was all God's. It is, but he puts you in charge of it. How crazy is that? We're talking about oversight. We're talking about stewardship. How crazy is it? He says, I'm gonna give you 100% oversight over the 100% that I'm gonna give to you and so that you get order and ownership in right perspective, I'm gonna ask for the first 10% first and the 90%, the rest of it, it's all yours to do whatever it is that you wanna do that honors me, okay? but he gives us oversight. So really at the end of the day, payday is test day. It is, it's pay payday is test day for you and it's test day for me. God says, trust me with the 10% and I'll take the 90% further than you can take the 100%. But here's the reality, I know that fear talks and fear talks loud, fear will say I'll never have enough. You say, Pace, if I had double, I still wouldn't be able to tithe, okay? And, and we think that the answer is more and the answer isn't more, the answer is trust God now. Okay, and if you think that when you get more, you'll trust God with the more, when you can't trust God with the little, you, have, you are delusional. That's right. You begin to trust him now yes. with the first and watch what he does, okay? Some of us also live with a scarcity mindset. Some of us were raised this way. We didn't have a whole lot. And so now that we're in a position where we, we're, we're now overseeing our own money and it's not our parents' money, uh, we're really tight. And we're afraid and we, we hold it close, okay? Every now and then, you know, I'll um, give Sarah Grace a, a, a treat and I test her. I do this on occasion and I ask her for, for something. Like the other day, she got a bunch of candy to make Valentine's out of, right? And I say, can, can daddy get a, a Reese's peanut butter cup? <laughs> and, uh, and, and in this moment, you know what she did? She said, yes. 
She passed the test. Now, there have been other times that she said no. Nope. Yeah. And what she doesn't realize is, man, I can buy lots of bags of candy and dump them over her little tiny head. Yeah. Okay? But, but this is a test, right? Yeah. This is a test. And like, hey, I want to make sure that you understand yeah. that, that dad is the giver of all candy, right? <laughs> Daddy is the candy man, right? <laughs> And, and, and so I want you to enjoy the candy. I want you to have the candy, but, but daddy says, hey, give me first. Give it to me first. I mean, hey, I'm all about that uh, P- Reese's peanut butter tie. What about y'all? Let's go. But we can't live with this scarcity mindset, okay? And so when I pass the test, the rest of the test is blessed. And here's what I mean by blessed, and we'll wrap up, okay? See, it wasn't that painful, wasn't it? Nope. Okay, here's, I'm just, just trying to help you, okay? Um, what I mean by blessed is two things, God's provision, Okay, God promises you if you live on sound biblical principles, he will bless the rest, okay? It doesn't mean that you you can be foolish with the rest of the 90%, okay, and that he'll bail you out, okay? God promises you, he promises you. Jesus himself said it. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things would be added to you, what? All the things we're worried about, all the, all the things that we're hoarding our money for, all the things we're saving our money for, all the things that we need money for. He says, if you'll seek me first, all these things, okay? So there's a promise of God's provision, and God's provision is this, your basic needs, okay? Shelter, food, promises you. It doesn't mean that you may, you may uh, move from um, having a nice house to a rental house, it doesn't mean that you, you, may not, you may take a loss on a car. It doesn't mean that you may, you know, may not take a, you may take a loss, that you may not take a loss on an investment. You lose your shirt in the stock market. It doesn't, doesn't mean that when, when God says, hey, I'm gonna provide for you, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be free from all those hard things. What he says is, I'm gonna provide for your basic needs. But then he says, not only that, I'm gonna protect you. I will protect you. Okay, and, and you still may have some loss financially, but I will protect you. And what it means is that God will bring blessing into your life when you need it to protect you. Yes. He will. I've seen this over and over and over in my life. I've seen this through medical bills. I've seen this in house sales. I've seen this um, in over and over again. When we moved to, the, uh, to North Idaho from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I served at a very large and prominent church. I've been there for almost 16 years. The church was incredibly generous to my family while I worked there. I don't think I'll ever, I don't wanna speak this over myself, but it, I made a lot of money. I don't know that I'll ever have that kind of salary. And when I resigned that church, from that church to begin our move here, there was a transition period of about four months that I had no income in a very large house, okay? But that was my choice. You know why? I had no idea how our bills were to be paid, but I know what God called me to do. I know what he called me to do. And so I stepped out in faith. I didn't do it foolishly. I stepped out in faith. In addition to not getting paid, the church that God called us to begin to plant, um, it also needed money, and it needed resource to get started. And, And guess how much we had in that bank account? Zero, okay? So what did Sarah and I have to do? Sarah and I had to go to our savings account and give the largest financial gift we've ever given towards the six-figure budget it required to start our church, okay? And that helped cover a large portion of the six-figure budget we needed to start, okay? In the middle of all this, I've got to tell you, I was like, wow, God, I'm stepping out in faith. I don't know where the money's coming. I'm believing it's coming, but I'm getting a little nervous. And I'll kid you not, if I didn't get a phone call from a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Willie George in Oklahoma, and in one phone call, one phone call, God made up and some for what it was that we gave. And that man blessed us for three years and helped us. Protected, God protected us. God provided for us. You see, the way you get beyond worrying about money is understanding it's not yours. It's understanding that there's an order and he comes first. And it's simply understanding that because of that, he's given you oversight. It's what he did with Adam and Eve. 
All this is yours. He gave us dominion and reign. Man, what a giving God we have. And then he says, hey, give me a tenth. Trust me in this. So here's the heart of our church. We get to give. We don't give to get. Okay? And I'll just say to you this, this, and I really mean this. If you're not in the place spiritually where you can give, where you don't trust God or you don't trust the church or when you give, you're, you're mad about giving, keep your money. Just keep it. It's okay. There's a good chance that that area of your life won't be blessed, but keep it. Because God is advancing his church. He's advancing his kingdom. He'll do it through a few of us. Okay? So, so you guys know, you're, if you've been here, you're here, if you've been here for a one-year preaching cycle, I maybe do this once, maybe twice a year. You know why? I'm not worried about it. Okay? It's between you and God. But I got to tell you what the word says. Okay? Now it's yours. Okay? And it's just another step. Okay? You know, it's interesting in this series, we're looking at all these details of trusting God with our, in our lives, the details of our lives. And they hit differently. Because for some of you, you've trust God in your finances. You're like, man, I've been tithing since I was a little boy. This is nothing. But when we start talking about trusting God with your pleasure, ooh, that gets a little sensitive, right? We all have a next step, okay? But here's the point. We all should be taking a next step. Some of you, and from what our finance team lets us know at the end of each year, most of us have a next step in this area. We need to trust God. That's all we invite you in to do. That's all we'll ever invite you in to do. Take a next step with Jesus. Find liberty and freedom in it. Amen.